Welcome to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. Like any good marriage, we will debate, evaluate, and sometimes quarrel about how privacy and security impact business in the 21st century. Hi, Jody Daniels here. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Clover Advisors, a certified women's privacy consultancy. I'm a privacy consultant and certified informational privacy professional, providing practical privacy advice to overwhelmed companies. Hi, Justin Daniels here. I'm a shareholder in corporate M&A and tech transaction lawyer at the law firm Baker Donaldson, advising companies in the deployment and scaling of technology. Since data is critical to every transaction, I help clients make informed business decisions while managing data privacy and cybersecurity risk. And when needed, I lead the legal cyber data breach response brigade. And this episode is brought to you by Ding, Red Clover Advisors. We help companies to comply with data privacy laws and establish customer trust so that they can grow and nurture integrity. We work with companies in a variety of fields, including technology, e-commerce, professional services, and digital media. In short, we use data privacy to transform the way companies do business. Together, we're creating a future where there's greater trust between companies and consumers. To learn more and to check out our best-selling book, Data Reimagined, Building Trust One Bite at a Time, visit redcloveradvisors.com. You ready for a good discussion today about protecting, uh, especially girls online? Indeed. That's where you kick us off. All right. Well, let's introduce our guest. Today, we have Angeline Corvalia with Data Girls and Friends. Angeline is on a mission to help young people learn to thrive in an AI-driven digital world. She is focused on preparing young minds to navigate and succeed in the ever-evolving digital landscape. Angeline, I guess Hi. it is what? Good afternoon where you are. It is the afternoon. Well, right Angeline, please nice do school. share where you're based because we learned the secret in pre-show, but not everyone else knows. Well, I'm based in southern Italy, uh, in Apulia, which is the heel of the Italian boot. Well, we could spend the entire episode just talking about Italy. We have uh, two girls in our family, and our older daughter is obsessed with Italy. Uh, but here we actually have to talk about you know, some other things. So we'll, uh, we'll have to save our uh, passion for Italy for another time, but we would love to hear how your career evolved to what you are doing now in uh, helping girls navigate this digital landscape. Well, it's a pretty, I would say, unique uh, path that I took. I was uh, in finance for a long time, and my last role was a CFO of a I was a medium-sized financial institution, and my daughter was born, and I realized um, that's not what I want her to strive towards, because that wasn't me. So I, I've been spending the last, I would say, three to five years looking for myself, um, what I really want to be. I worked at a, at, a, at a software services company, and then I would say around six months ago, the light came on, uh, David Girl and Friends. Uh, what I could do, taking all of my knowledge and experience and really help, uh, help, as you said, the youth, the children to be able to survive better in this crazy world that's evolving by the minute. Yeah. So that's what I've dedicated my life to. Well, I know we're going to dive a little bit more into that. So we're looking forward to hearing more detail. Yes, we are. And so we want to start off and just ask you, how did your career evolve into your current role? I just asked that, silly goose. Are you serious? <laughs> I did. <sighs> I am so but sorry. Was, Clearly, it, I'm, I need a reset. Clearly, you are. It was I finance. Need a reset. You need yeah, a it was finance and then software services. And then I was going off. I didn't leave. I, I left the part out where I, I was looking after my own ideas and okay. uh, spent some time. And then I found Data Girl after some months of soul searching. All right. Then let's talk a little bit about uh, Data Girl. Where did your inspiration for it come from? Well, it started, I would say, just around nine months ago, um, where I was obviously still, I had a lot of the software IT uh, gang um, in my LinkedIn, and everyone was talking about AI and, you know, this big hype and all the hype cycle of this. 
And I realized that the regular average person was completely left out of this. Um, so I started to um, really inform myself, especially about AI and the impacts on online security and on the average uh, person who doesn't really pay attention to what's going on. And I started following some people on LinkedIn and I found Bill Schmarzo, which was an amazing inspiration from me. Uh, he was the, he's the Dean of Big Data. Uh, and then now he's really, he's written a book called Citizens of Data Science, um, trying to help people, um, the average person uh, kind of learn data science. And he wrote an article for children trying to explain to them about how their data was used. And then I said, well, I think this would, probably come over better if it was a video. Uh, and I created a video. And I said, I asked him, can I create a video? And I created this little short video, um, the first Data Girl episode, and he really loved it. And a lot of people loved it. Uh, and I realized I love creating, taking complex uh, concepts and putting them to simple terms. Um, and, and there's a really the need there. So that's how it was is born. And then someone came and said, why don't you add AI? So we have a character for AI and they have a character for online security. You mentioned that the average person has been left out of the conversation. And I think the average parent also doesn't really understand what are the online risks for girls? What would you tell those parents? Well, I would say, yeah, they definitely don't understand. I mean, if people are, I, I would tell those parents that it's kind of, okay not to know um not to know the risk because we do have a society where the adults are always supposed to teach the children um but in the case of the online world now i think most adults don't actually know what's going on online they can't imagine the impact of ai for example on the risks um related to to the online world and i would just tell the, the average parent that um it's okay not to know, um, but you really need to open dialogue uh, with your children about it. Can you share perhaps a few of those risks? What are maybe two or three of the common risks that you think parents need to know and might not? Well, I think the parents, I mean, just the basic concept that, that a lot of people have in their mind, if they share their data, they share too much, uh, they're going to have, uh, there's going to be personalized ads. Uh, but it's so much more than personalized ads um, that that predators, for example, can use AI in a way that can kind of automate the grooming of children um, because they can they can program chatbots. That's what they're doing is programming chatbots um, that will talk talk to their children, um, and and they, these obviously learn to get more efficient over time. So they can even groom the children without even being personally involved. Uh, so to speak, and the other aspect, of course, is that the, you can a private person can um, with tech know-how obviously can scrape data from social media, and and they could use it again with AI because AI can uh, analyze large amounts of data to find potential uh, victims that are more vulnerable based on what they're they're uh, putting online. And of course, we hear a lot about the media about deep fakes. I think people are aware of deep fake images and videos that can be created of children that was in the news with Taylor, Taylor Swift. Um, but also there can be deep fakes of celebrities and influencers who can they can write directly to the children um, and, and try to get their trust. Uh, so it's a completely different world than I think a lot of parents can imagine exists. Yeah, the uh, AI chatbot, we've had a couple conversations about that on the show, and that entire concept just is super, super scary. Even as an adult, how do I, I, I want to be able to trust that I'm talking to a, a human or at least a not trickery chatbot, and that this is where we've come with companies creating these chatbots is, I think, just very scary. I think they feel the need to create them because their view is, is if they don't do it, their competition will, and they're in a race for market dominance and don't view it as part of their mission to think about what are some of the implications like using a chat bot to groom a child on something like Snapchat, which is awful, but that seems to be the reality. 
it doesn't appear that we learned very much from what happened with social media. Um, that that <laughs> it's a moment in AI where you know the whole landscape is developing in a way uh, that it hasn't, um, it just hadn't uh, previously. And yeah, we should have learned from what what went wrong with social media, but it really doesn't appear, as you said, it doesn't really appear that we have. Um, and uh, it, yeah, as you said, it's the competition. Who's going to get there faster? Who's going to who who's going to get you know the most people there? Um, and the vulnerable are the ones that are kind of being left behind. That's that's one of the main reasons why I do what I do is that the vulnerable all are being left behind. And you know that if people with awareness, if we can plant awareness in in the younger generation. We can at least help them protect themselves where um, technology companies aren't necessarily stepping up. So, you know, in particular, um, because, you know, you're focused on data girls and friends is, can you talk a little bit specifically about what are some of the online pressures that girls specifically face from your perspective? Girls and boys uh, face the same pressures, but girls, um, obviously, they have the the societal expectations um, that are different. Obviously, I've lived in six different countries, so it's different in each country to which degree uh, this is true. Um, but girls, uh, obviously, they have some expectation from the beginning, from very early on. I also have a daughter, a young daughter, and I was shocked at how early people were throwing certain expectations about how she had to be, how she had to act, how she had to look. And people are, are you know, saying this uh, to girls. And these are a lot of these things are exactly the, the kind of um, aspects that online that, that uh, you can see with the influencers, with beauty, with uh, fashion, with you know, you know being perfect, uh, the, the the illusion of perfection. Uh, this is that affects girls more um, because they generally always also have the expectation from society outside of the online world. Um, um, and then obviously there's the aspect that girls start puberty earlier. Um, so in general, and once they hit puberty, they'll start looking for social connections outside of the family. Um, and generally, so I've seen some studies. Um, I we'll see that that that's a moment where it puts them more at risk um, because if they go into the online world, um, they haven't really solidified their their offline presence enough because they're a few years younger than the boys might have those urges. Uh, so those are uh, pressures that girls kind of find us um, face more than than boys. Parents often hear from their teenage girls, you're just being overprotective. I'm smart enough. I won't talk to those people. I will block them. It'll only be my friends. You don't have anything to worry about. What would you tell those parents of how to explain these risks that we're talking about here to their teenage daughters or cousins or nieces or nephews or yeah. right, fill in the blank? I guess not nephews in this specific situation. But you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that there's obviously no simple answer because each family uh, dynamic will be different. Um, uh, but I think it's important for the parents can tell their children. Um, it's also something they say about, about cyber attacks, for example. It's not a question of if you're going to have an issue. It's a question of when. Um, I, I've seen, obviously, a lot of statistics. And there was one... I think some uh, watch internet watch foundation or something from the UK where they said 77% of girls uh, within the first, I don't remember how many, six to 12 months of being online had already seen inappropriate images. And, and it's, it's just mind boggling. So if someone says, no, it's going to be fine, then the answer needs to be, no, it's not going to be fine because that's uh, there's just too much sophistication on the other side. Um, and that said, um, to really open dialogue uh, with with the kids, with the girls, and say we have to solve this together, because I'm also not a cybersecurity expert, um, and open the dialogue. Don't set rules without explaining and discussing. Treat. I think if parents treat their their children 
as responsible beings that can talk through and can find compromises, then a basis of trust can be can be found. And then slowly over time, the, the, there can be um, discussion and understanding between them. So you had mentioned earlier that you've lived in several different countries and you're raising your own child. And what is your perspective around what you've seen in various countries around the world about how privacy laws are evolving when it comes to protecting kids? Well, I, I'm spoiled, obviously, because I live in Europe. Uh, we have GDPR and um I'm really thankful for that. Every time I come back to the U.S. to visit my parents, I can really even tell the difference on my on my devices how much more protected I am in Italy. Um, but I, I really see that that awareness is kind of growing. I've also uh, read that even in in Asia, apparently that the privacy laws are even more kind of protective than in Europe in some in some countries. In the U.S., it's kind of heartening to see um, some movements happening. Obviously, with uh, California as a as a, has kind of been leading the way, and states are um, states are some states are following up on the privacy protection laws, especially aimed at children, like with this age specific design code, for example, that the, the California has. Um, yeah, and the, the federal government in the U.S. is working somehow. Angel discussing. <laughs> Angeline, I'm curious. You said that you can tell a significant difference in your home country compared to when you come to the U.S. Can you share an example of how you're seeing that literally you mentioned on your devices? Well, I mean, it mostly has to do with cookies. I have to say that that um, <clears throat> I'm really big on, on making sure my cookies are all, all turned off and it's not much of an issue in Europe because it's the law that every time I open a web page, uh, then I get the cookies, uh, that I can select the cookies. And I can see when I come to the U.S. that that's not always the case, that I, I can just get into websites without uh, without selecting cookies. And then I just notice that that this doesn't happen uh, in Europe, that I always get to select my cookies. In the U.S., I sometimes have to do some extra effort to find them. Uh, yeah, that's true. Significant difference and overall philosophy, even in the states here that have privacy laws compared to what we have in GDPR. So interesting, uh, interesting comparison. I'm curious, Angeline, what tip we always ask everyone, what is their best personal privacy tip? And here, I would love to hear what would you tell parents listening to this episode? What specifically they could do to help protect their daughter? online well i mean i'll just start with i don't mind i have two uh one is Please. is a very basic one whatever privacy setting you can turn on just turn it on i wouldn't even think it through because your data is gonna um pass in two or three other ways anyway that you're not aware of um so that's the first one um i'm not sure that you know people that push the cookies accept i always wonder about that so just push no cookies reject uh, but the other one is um, really uh, not to underestimate talking, talking because we really tend to overestimate the um, uh, that children will know what to do online. We because our devices are so user friendly and so easy to to kind of we can figure out how to use it that we confuse that with understanding how to use it correctly and safely. Um, and, and so I, what parents really should do, uh, the best privacy tip is teach their children critical thinking, to teach them and work together, walk, talk it through. Why, every, teach them to ask, why does this person want this information? Why does this, this uh, web page or app want this information? Um, who is actually behind it? The critical thinking um, is the best privacy tip for me uh, to, to really, yeah, because it, it how whatever the tech scene will throw at you, if you have critical thinking, then you will be in a much much better position to protect your privacy, um, and and stay safe. I 
Completely agree. I love the idea of critical thinking. That's something Justin, you and I have been talking about a lot when it comes to this concept of digital citizenship and trying to get people to understand what is real, what is not. Can I trust this? Can I not? What should I do? When should I seek additional help? It's a really important skill. But it sounds like one of the other things that Angeline is saying is even if you think your kids are tuning you out and it seems like an insurmountable mountain to get through to them, I, it sounds to me like it doesn't mean you stop communicating and telling them things, even if they roll their eyes, because on some level, I think when they're out and you're not around, they have this little, little avatar talking to them that my parents say this, my parents say this, because I doubt they ever want to admit to it, because I know Jody and I struggle with that. And we continue to tell our kids that even though they roll their eyes, they act like they're not listening, but I kind of think they are. They are. It's, it's mastering repetition and redundancy. Mm, yes, Justin, exactly. that is an, a specialty of yours, repetition and redundancy. Well, I think I, mean, I also left out that another way you can, can gain their trust is talk about your online, your own online experience with them um, or so it's not just taking, but it's also giving uh, them because obviously we talk a lot about protecting children because they're more, more vulnerable, but adults are also attacked. Um, so if if we say, oh, look what happened to me, uh, look what doubts I have, I read this, this scared me, uh, let's talk it through, that that will also um, help build the trust, but yeah, as Justin said. Uh, repeating things in a respectful way will plant really important seeds later on. Don't give up. I like it. Don't give up. Don't give up. I think that's the message for parents. It is in all more ways than, than just protecting people online. Don't give up. So, so Angeline, what do you like to do for fun when you're not protecting girls online? Well, uh, I try to have the exact polar opposite of, uh, thinking about AI and data security and predators and all of this. Um, so my fun is spending time in nature, really. I have uh, a bunch of animals, um, and obviously I live in a very beautiful area of, of the world, so I do a lot of walking and visiting the sea and kind of just staring at trees sometimes if it's been a hard day. <laughs> you know what I noticed, Justin, is that a lot of our guests who spend a significant amount of time on screens and talking about some significantly serious issues on privacy and security, all like to go far away from their computers and go to nature. We have a lot of hikers and bikers and yes. kayakers and skiers and a lot of outdoor enthusiasts in this industry. Yes, I think being in front of a computer screen all day, it's taxing. It really, it really is. Well, Angeline, where can people go to learn more? Um, well, it's, it's, it's Data Girl and Friends. Uh, the probably easiest way is to look on LinkedIn. Uh, we have, I have a web page, um, a page, Data Girl and Friends. Um, and there you can have links to, to I have the videos on Vimeo and then obviously have a website um, and, and on, uh, on YouTube. So that's the best way to find us on, on LinkedIn and then branch out to our other resources. Wonderful. Well, Angeline, as parents of two girls, thank you for what you're doing to protect girls online. And for everyone listening, please be sure to check out those resources and share them with all the people that you know so that we can continue to protect the next generation online. Angeline, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me and really for, for pushing these issues. I know you've done it with a lot of other speakers, so it's really... So important. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check us out on LinkedIn. See you next time.